Hey everybody, this is Devin Francis, also known as Leonard Monster. And I'm letting you all know it's his birthday. He's old. It is my birthday today. You're old. I keep forgetting. You're so old. I, yeah, I'm even older than I was the old before. You're old. Um, um it's not episode as old. 128, which is like, that's a pretty big number. That's what, 2 to the 7, right? Yeah. Oh. Um, what are we doing today, Victoria? Uh, we're going to be reviewing the Oasis episode of the month, which is Legend of Sperry McGurk, and then we're going to be doing For The August, Other Woman yeah. from album 28. Hi. So, no news, as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah. Episode 820, The Legend of Sperry McGurk, written by Phil Waller. What happens, Victoria? Uh, this episode is... A lot like Drake the Cosmic Copper, in that I can say uh, the title without laughing after listening to it, and I have listened to the episode multiple times because I actually liked it. So this episode is a historical drama, um, which takes place during a war. I can't remember which. It's a civil war. Civil war. Kind of like whole point, like yeah. slavery. North South Army is um, kind of a major key thing here. Was Sperry McGurk African American? No. I couldn't figure that out. Okay, because I thought he was like the guy who was freaking out on the cover artwork, but then I realized after a couple of listens that he was the other guy. Yeah, and I don't was the think the scene where the slave died. Yeah, you know, the I don't. Name slave guy. I don't think he could have passed for a, See, that's a what southern. Confused I don't think he could have passed for a Confederate officer if he was black, Victoria. I mean, it's Odyssey. Anything can happen. Adventure is an Odyssey. Anyway, so this is a historical drama which takes place in Odyssey and the surrounding area during the Civil War, and we get some more origin stuff for Wood's End because except not it's very except because the not, church was burnt down when this episode yeah. happens. Um, so, Spree McGurk is a really interesting character, actually. He's a, like, you find out he's a traitor, and then you find out he's another traitor to those people he's trading against, and then you find out he's, like, another traitor because he just works for himself or something like that, and it's confusing. There's a lot of turn coding, uh, a lot of coats because it's a war. Yeah. And most Blue of coats and gray coats and turn coats. coats. Not red coats. <laughs> um, and so then he feels bad for all the bad stuff he does. So long story short, uh, he becomes the first pastor of Odyssey Church. Short story short. Yeah, more short like. story short. It's really... This episode concludes very quickly. I feel like it easily could have uh -huh. been a two-parter. That's like... My, I like this episode, but I do have a couple criticisms for it. One is, I feel like it could have been a two-parter, because I, I wanted to see more Spare McGurk. He was really interesting, but we just didn't really... I feel like I didn't get a good enough feel for his character, even though he was there a lot. Renee was in this episode. The writers remember she exists. Uh, they apparently caught her while she was walking around in the park. In Crash Course. In Crash Course. And they dragged her back for another OAC episode. Um, so it's it's nice to hear from Renee and it, again. For a minute, I was worried at the end that this was going to be the one where she was a Christian. I was like, this one was okay, but it's not good enough for that yet. Uh, also, I wish that it was um, an actual Imagination Station episode. Because like I said, like, what episode was it? Like two episodes ago? Mm-hmm of the Oddcast, I said that it's been a really long time Yeah, since but you we weren't had... counting AIOC, and that's what this is. Still, we haven't had a lot of um, Imagination way, Station it's true. ones in that either. But yeah, I wish it was Renee going on an Imagination Station adventure and meeting him, because I feel like it would have been more interesting if she was interacting with him, rather than him just doing everything by himself, and mm -hmm. then it could easily be justified as a two-parter. Especially since we know that this is already in the Imagination Station. No, she was programming it. It wasn't in it yet. 
Well, oh yeah. But it was explaining. Yeah, I was gonna say because I plot to Renee so she could record it, and I'm like, why don't you just take one of the multiple textbooks or the journal which you've established? Maybe he can't get his hands on it, but like. Why it don't should, they use the book thing it, to scan Even more adventure? so, though, it should already be in there because, and I'll, I'll get there early because this is the history of Odyssey. That's what the search program was invented upon. Maybe Eugene, maybe they didn't know, they haven't, like, found the journal by that point. Yeah, when but it was made. And still it means that even if it wasn't in there, then they should be able to scan in the journal. Like, this is the foundation of how it was my, invented. My only reasoning is they can't, scan in the journal because it's considered too precious to like lend it out just to be scanned you could just take but. pictures and just transcribe it to text oh no i'm trying to make sense of it no there's no sense okay yeah so we're hearing about odyssey during the civil war it's about to be overrun by it was some, interesting some sort of especially merciless squadron of the confederate army that's going to burn the town down and the titular Sperry mcgurk is a union lieutenant in charge of protecting the town. So this takes place, like, it, depending on when in the Civil War this is, it's like 11 to 15 years-ish after the events of the Underground Railroad. So they mention the telegraph office, which would not likely be in Wits End. We know that in 1850, uh, less than 12 months before the Underground Railroad, is when the first telegraph line was installed My hat's super in the perfect. church. Um, and, and, you know, obviously that burned down. Um, the Fillmore was built sometime between the church burning down in 1910, which is a huge time gap. We don't know when it was built in there. Uh, but either way, it wasn't only the first, uh, it wasn't only the first telegraph line in town that was installed there earlier in the year Underground Railroad before the fire. Um, so the office is probably a different building, the telegraph office. So it isn't, it is most likely not the church. Like, the, the it's not the future Fillmore that they were talking about there. That's probably burnt down at this point, and it's a different building that's the telegraph office. So that building does not really exist, obviously, apart from the church tower and the, the rectory, like, you know, the stuff that survived and got built into the Tate House. Uh, not the Tate House, the... Fillmore the Fillmore, yeah, center. model on the Tate House. Um, so, Renee, I was as as it, once the episode started, I was really curious about what the framing device was supposed to be because it just kind of launched into the storytelling, and it was a couple yeah. minutes in before we finally found out like what the framing was here. Um, also, before I forget, uh, when Sperry McGurk becomes the pastor at the end, mm -hmm. he changes his name, and that's why no one knew that he was Ferry McGurk. Yep. And I'm like, honestly, I would have changed my name sooner. I'm surprised he... <laughs> At least he changed it to something normal because Ferry McGurk is the worst name ever. It sounds like a VeggieTales character. I still think so. I remember I said that in an earlier episode. Yeah, I like, but, I like yeah. how... It was like, everyone in Odyssey knows about Sperry McGurk. All the kids learn about him in school. They reenact his story in plays. And we celebrate his sacrifice every year. And I was like, oh, yeah, totally. Remember all those Sperry McGurk parties? The Remember all Zoe, everyone's best friend? Yeah, all those Sperry McGurk parties are all the time. And then it was like, oh, and then we stopped cel celebrating him in the 60s. And I was like, oh, well, never mind. Okay, that makes sense then. He, found he was a liar. And then we found out he was a double liar. Yeah. And I have to say, at the top of the episode, when they're like, we got a warning that Morgan is approaching on the telegraph line, and then the line was cut immediately after, I was like, I smell something fishy in the state of Denmark. And it turns out I was right. So it's supposed to be something from Hamlet. Yeah. Um, so, we yeah, we find out that it's like, oh, Sperry McGurk was a traitor. He was actually a Confederate lieutenant scamming him out of stuff. Um, and then double plot twist. He's actually he just talks a, to his horse. He's a Westerner con artist who don't work for nobody, just making lots of money scamming. Uh, yeah, I well, was like, like, he said, I feel like this should be a two parter. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, like I, I was like, wow, I didn't see that coming. And the epis, like the end of it, like oh, he was the pastor all along. Like it was, lots There's of plot so twists. many plot twists. The episode ended way earlier than I thought it would. The setup of yeah. it made me it feel like it was going to be a two-parter. Like, 
what I felt was he got injured, and the guy's like, oh, you need forgiveness and stuff like that. Transformation. I thought he was going to leave Odyssey and set out on, like, a journey of exploration before returning to the town. And that's I was really... hoping they were, like, going to develop, like, everything he went through a lot, but then he was like, nope, he's yeah. pastor, born again Christian. I thought there was going to be, like... Hallelujah, praise God. Leave. We found his journal. This whole, like trip and revelation as he journeys and then he eventually works his way back to town and like the journal's like, completed to find like the end of his story i wanted um, like a saint paul thing and i got like what, not that i think the reason it felt so much like it was going to be a two-parter is the way it was told made it feel like it was based on a true story that and those and those stories very typically would be two parts and there would be more to it than that um, but this was just a story that it was entirely fabricated for the show, In and terms so it was only one part. Of historicalness, because that's totally a word. Uh, I feel like I could actually see this being like a real historical story. It, yeah, it made a lot of sense. It wasn't like too crazy. The only thing I have a sense of disbelief about is the name, because. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it was... it's hard to get past that. I know I keep on dwelling on it, but it's it's hard to get past that. I feel like if he had a normal name, then I would buy this a lot more. I mean, you know, mid eighteen hundreds. He was from like California, I think. That it's like I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna look it up. All right. Um, as Victoria also brought up. It seems very odd to me that Renee is working on programming this story into the Imagination Station, because not only can the station generate programs based on inputted historical data, uh, but the very first place that we ever learned it was possible to do that, the first place that that was invented as an input method for the station, was for the history of the town of Odyssey, because it started with Eugene's search program, A Darkness Before Dawn, where he did it with his journal, and then with the history of the town so they could find uh, Rukuta. Yeah, and I can see some people arguing that, like, the doors don't have the scanner, but yes, they do. Well, they yeah, obviously you program it the same. Oh, uh, no. There you go. Sperry is a first name. No, it's also, like, mainly a girl's name. So... Which is a terrible name for anyone. So I would assume, then, that the, um... When Isaiah Newman was the pastor in Odyssey, uh, he was probably like the the pastor of Odyssey Community Church. So the Leicestershire name. Leicestershire. Leicestershire. Uh, does that make sense to you, Richard? Would you agree with that assessment? Something Community Church. That he was probably the pastor of Odyssey Community Church since uh, the church was already burnt down and wouldn't be. Well. Yeah, didn't I say that at the beginning? Kind of. I mean, there's multiple churches in town. But... I like to think that the only church that exists in historical ones is the one that became Wood's End. Well, that's clearly not true. I know, but I like to dream sometimes. So Isaiah Newman wasn't a pastor then? Uh... Sperry McGurk was the pastor. Devin, did you listen to the episode? No, I, I actually didn't listen to it at all. I've and just been bluffing. You are amazing at guessing what happened. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm assuming that this is how Odyssey Community Church took over as like the main church in town from the old one because that one burned down, and then Isaiah Newman like takes over Odyssey Community Church, becomes the pastor. It's incredibly fruitful and prosperous with all the stuff he, he does, and then that's how it becomes become a pastor becomes so quickly. like the town's main church, uh, because the Witten Church burned down like a, a decade to a decade and a half ago. They make it well, sound he went to like seminary. he just like walked in. Like, no, it's like hey. he had to go get his degree. Why didn't we get any of that? Why wasn't it a two-parter? Because this year is already going to have, like, 13 episodes in the AOC, okay? I want my Hobbit episodes. Well, they're coming starting in five days, so... <gasps> really? Well, the first part is. Yay! Six days, I guess. Um, so, the uh, video documentary was... A, I really liked it. It was pretty cool. Did this have a charity of a month? No. Okay, that's what I thought. 
Um, the documentary focuses on a Civil War historian, primarily, who shows off some artifacts. Uh, one of them is the Journal of Longfellow, author of Paul Revere's poem, uh, or the Paul Revere poem. And it was interesting, I thought, to learn that Longfellow wrote the poem during the Civil War to remind people back to the Revolutionary War to remember why they were fighting that war. Um, and he talks about how important this history, the Civil War history, is to him as a black man to allow him to be free to read and write and work and live and collect these artifacts. He has a first edition of a historical book from the war, like it was written during the war, and it was like a history textbook from written during the war of even older stuff. Um, and it contained a treatise on why black people deserved their freedom and deserved to fight for their own freedom. And it had, he also has the original letter that proves that Lincoln consulted that book right before he signed off on the Emancipation Proclamation, which is pretty cool. And these aren't like copies of the letter in the book. I like these are like Lincoln. these are like the original editions of it and like the like, original letter Lincoln itself. Lincoln is like, like one neat. of the two U.S. presidents. I like pretty cool. And I told someone that I liked Lincoln when I came back to Castlegar from class and then they started and that person started going on a rant about why he hates Lincoln and I was like yeah cool for you bro you can go do something else um and then we also hear from a sculptor whose name is Clay which is hilarious that, and it's like that joke from the office or it's like my dentist is named Crentis no oh, that sounds like, a lot like dentist do you think that's why he became a dentist <laughs> Yeah, it's like, so yeah, there's a bit with a sculptor whose name is Clay, and I think that's all I need to say about that segment yeah. of the documentary, because that is hilarious. There's nothing else I need to know that will be better than that. <laughs> there's a little bit of recording footage from the recording of the episode, um, and then the trailer for Muli, which is an upcoming film about a Kenyan man who became a self-made millionaire, and then he used all of that wealth to adopt and care for a huge number of orphans. And then that would later become like this huge, large ministry of adopting orphans in Kenya. What kind cool. of movie? Like a, like a drama D or a drama, like a drama no, doc, I doc, mean, like, drama D. Uh, self funded, like small scale funded or like, I don't know. It had a bunch of like awards with all of freeze around them. So like an indie documentary, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so like won a bunch of like film festival awards, I think, was in there. Indie films have grown on me more with time because I've seen I've Becoming only seen increasingly like, hipster. No, I've only seen like two indie films that I can think of. One might not actually I'm count sure as sure you've film seen more. That I can think of. Um, That's yeah. what I just said. Um but like I liked both of them. One was What We Do in the Shadows, which Shadow is film. a really good movie. The other was uh, the ghost one with Kristen Stewart, which was okay. It had one scene that I really, really liked in it, which so, I still want to show you that scene. So, yeah, Spirit and McGurk. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. I thought it was good. I've listened to it a lot more than I thought I would. I think I've listened to it four times, and that was in the span of about... A week and a half, probably. I, I, I listened to it back to back after I first heard it because I felt like there's a lot to unpack, especially in the beginning. Um, so, like, that one was mostly just for clarification. The other times it was for clarification and enjoyment. So, uh, I feel like Renee could have been switched out with anyone. Pretty well, much, the episode wasn't was. about her. I know, I'm just saying so i don't know who but yeah it's it's always lovely to have episodes about the history of the town of odyssey it did this didn't really help fill in wit's ends timeline per se because yeah. it didn't it kind of was ash mostly picture this right now Eugene probably telling buck and jules about the legend of spirit and the Girk. 
just while he's like working on the program for it and they ask him what he's doing would you prefer that to what telling renee about it well d yeah obviously i don't think it would make a terrible difference but yes i would be i would be more amenable to that relatively I, speaking i'm still not sure if i like renee honestly i like renee and i like Amy pemberton like, I don't know. I she just needs to grow on me more. I mean I mean I don't like the way she's drawn. Uh I think she looks too much like Connie. It confuses me sometimes. She always has like a horrific grimace on her face in the yeah. artwork. Um I don't know, maybe it's just me because Penny it took me a while for Penny to grow on me. Now I like really love her. And it might be the same thing with Renee, although I hope that Renee does not stay as long as Penny. I think that once Renee's arc is done, she should leave. <laughs> you've had your time in the... Okay, you're the Christian, dim, now go. You've had your time in the very dim, kind of off-to-the-side spotlight. <laughs> uh, now you can go. <laughs> leave. You've we're said, done with you, you said your two lines, and now we're going to take, like, the little bow peep crooks around your neck and drag we'll you off give you a stage. running start to go back into the forest before we chase you down again. This time we will not be as merciful when we catch you. Just let... Let, let Renee go, 20, let, 20, 20, let there be grown women characters on the show, Victoria. Didn't you hear what Kathy said? Yeah, but I... Has that episode come out? No, it's I the know. next one after yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Spoilers. Still, I... Let Connie um, have friends that aren't just old men. Connie's had, like, one conversation with Renee, and that was in the imagination station. It does not count. Let Connie hang out with people that aren't just we old men no and children. We have no proof that they have in ever interacted. She didn't even recognize Renee in Crash Course. For all we know, Eugene is the only person outside, like, other than Wit in the main trio who's talked to Renee. You can't say I'm wrong and that kills you. Look at that face. He's upset. My, I've done it. I ruined so, your birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Sperry, Sperry McGurk. Oh, that's such a bad name. I think I give it a 3.5. It was interesting how many plot twists they could fit into such a short thing. Do you think it was too many plot twists given the length of the episode? Uh, I, I feel like the feel last like one was. should have been developed more, but well, I like feel... like him being the pastor? Yeah, like there should have been more lead up to that. But, um, I think that they all fit well, actually, which is pretty impressive considering yeah, was... how much information was packed in there. I feel like it was a little on the nose to make the runaway slaves named G.C. Chrisom to sound like Jesus Christ. Oh, I didn't even... I was, I was wondering if that's what was going on, and then they, like, hinted at it in the, uh, the web quest stuff, and I was like, okay, I was right, yeah. You did it on purpose. Yeah. I wondered well, if his name e. was M. Lynn meant M. Lynn, but I wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> even even ignoring like Chrisom as his last name to sound like Christ, his first name being G C. Even though it wasn't spelled like that, it was like G C. Sounds like G C. G C. Guy G C. Jesus Christ, but with a G instead of a J. I realized just now as I'm saying. We're so sneaky. Um. Do you think someone's watching and they're like, you figured it out? It was. It, it's like the Rick and Morty email, where it's just like we gotta get rid of all the scripts. They wrote it. They wrote it. They figured it out, guys. We spent such long nights there's layering actually, all there's this. There's actually in. a six album upcoming arc around like the legacy of GC Chrisom that we've just destroyed now. No, you've destroyed it. That's I true. did. That's, Happy birthday. This blood is on my hands now. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Good good episode. It wasn't like super crazy incredible, but it was like I like history, civil war, freeing the slaves, plot twist, Renee was there. I'm gonna give it mm, mm. Mm, what'd you give it? Three point five. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, 3.5 too. You give it the same rating as me. 3.5. <laughs>
<laughs> this never stopped us before. It hasn't. It, um, um, I wouldn't say never. Okay, yeah, that's not true. It's but yeah, rarely three, stopped us. Three point five as well. Yeah, I feel like it probably should have been a two parter. Um, I feel like I there's a lot though. more potential to this story to unpack. Yeah, I wish we got to know his character more. Yeah, it especially just, like, since cut and then stopped. Everything. Especially since it plays into the history of Odyssey and like the history of presumably Odyssey Community Church, that would have been really interesting yeah. if we could have gotten more about that. I but. guess like the theme kind of had to do more with like the first half and not really. The rest. Oh no, it's, it's still about redemption. Have. Yeah, it's so. still about redemption. So I feel like. It focused on all the bad stuff, and then it just jump cut to the good in like one sentence. Yeah, he didn't really it. do it didn't actually much show good the apart from like after he becomes a it, pastor. It had like all the people getting their stuff back um, in a flash forward. Yeah, but he never. Actually, I like that they pointed out that he was kind of a bit of a coward, and he never revealed to anyone. Yeah. What he did, I was like, that seems realistic to me. I like that instead of him just being like, "Hey guys, I'm a terrible person. I'm but not anymore. Santa Claus. I'm sorry." Delivering all those vampires. <laughs> and... Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about this episode. Um. Yeah, I don't really think I have anything else to say. So. Either. Uh, should we talk about the other woman, Victoria? Yes. All right. Let's just roll on. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Roll on with this. Let's keep rolling. The other rolling, woman. Rolling. Album 28, Welcome Home. This is an amazing episode. This one uh, we have the most to say on. Um, episode 368, written by Paul McCusker. What happens in The Other Woman, Victoria? This episode breaks me, but then builds me up again. And then breaks you again. And then breaks me again. So, remember how we've talked in a couple episodes, like Tornado and We've kind I of been on this, floor. like, we've this been, like, gradually, developmental kick. Um, putting, like, more and more Bart character development yeah. into the show. Um, and we also did... Oh, the first one we did was the one where, like, Rodney um, goes missing. And that was, like, a versus that we did. That's true. So that would have been the, the first. Missing person. That would have been the first of the little Bart Rothbone arc we have going. I wouldn't really include I guess sort of. Sort of. We talked about him in that. Yeah. A lot. That's true. Um, this might be the last of the Bart Rothbone arc that we talk about. Or at least for a while. I don't know. Um, at least Bart being a deep character. This is probably, next to Tornado, the deepest he gets. Mm. So, The Other Woman, easily one of my favorite Odyssey episodes. Very, very good. I think we can both say, I don't know why we've waited so long to I don't either. We can both it. easy give this, like, five stars right now. Uh, yep. Review's over. Yeah, uh, review's thank over. you for joining us on our slash YouTube. <laughs> Go listen to it. Go listen to The Other Woman. Come back. Yeah, Seriously. all of them. All the other women. No, I'm I'm actually serious. Victoria, though, what happens in the episode? That, like people should stop and listen to it now. Um, so this episode uh, is the first episode since Thank You God in album four. Three. Three, thank you. Um, where we get to see Agnes Riley. And so this episode Or even is, hear her name mentioned, basically. Yeah. So There's this one episode is too. one of the last episodes for Tom as mayor, and it has him kind of saying that he's not going to be mayor again, and that's more of like a minor thing going on. And Bart's talking about how he wants to go into the running for mayor again and stuff, so he wants to kind of convince Tom to stop being the mayor. And he tries to get like some dirt on Tom with help from Doris and Rodney. And in the process, he sees Tom hooking up with some ladies who have, like, he thinks multiple ladies because the hair color is changing, and the woman who... They thought it was one person, yeah. and I wouldn't say he saw 
Tom hooking up with a lady. Okay. He saw him sitting, sitting on a bench with a lady. You have there's different a, interpretations to hooking up than I do, there's, apparently. There's a significant difference there, Victoria. You and I have different ideas of romance, Devin. That's true. That's very true. Um, so, yeah, and then Tom finds out when he tries to use this against Tom that that lady is Agnes, and he finds out that she's in Hillingdale, and at first they think that it is a very fancy restaurant, or hotel, sorry. A ritzy resort. Yeah. <laughs> or a restaurant. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> Some people live in restaurants, right? That's I mean, a thing people do. <laughs> yeah. It's a good enough restaurant. Um, this isn't Dilbert, Victoria. Dilbert the Animated Series. Anyway, so then they find out uh, everything, and then Tom tells the press about Agnes, and it's like really emotional, and Bart gets really upset, and Doris gets really upset, and so does Rodney. And well, Rodney doesn't. Rodney doesn't. Bart I mean, actually I guess he gets upset at, at his parents. Because of that. Oh, Rodney also... How did I forget? Out of jail. Rodney gets out of jail in this episode. This is his first episode since Slacker Chronicles, where he gets out of jail. That's actually how the episode begins. Um, and he's talking about how much it sucks in jail. And then Doris starts hitting him, and she's like, I bet they didn't let you leave your laundry all over the ground. And um, there's some really funny lines in this episode, though, like especially when... Doris and Rodney are driving in the car and they're trying to meet incognito. So then Rodney like tells says duck and he ducks and then she ducks and he's like, No, you can't duck, you're driving. They thought, almost like swerve and hit someone. Yeah. I thought you were gonna say, um, when Doris says to Bart, like, maybe Riley's one of those miso the chauvinist, misogynist <laughs> types who keeps his wife locked up at home, doesn't let her out or do anything. You know, Bart, kinda like you. <laughs> Oh, Doris. Um, Doris kind of reminds me of, like, a more chill version of Harley Quinn. What, just the accent, you mean? Yeah. I mean... I'm terrible. Yeah, she has a heavy New York accent. That is, yeah, yeah, like Harley Quinn. Yes. Yeah, so you know what weirds me out? Uh, she doesn't, before she becomes a supervillain, she doesn't have an accent. Oh, I, th I thought you were talking about Doris. No, because, like, when she's a therapist in Arkham, she just has just a general American accent, and then she spontaneously gets a New York accent as soon as she hooks up with Joker, and I'll, I don't I don't know how that works, but, like, you do you. Anyways, so, that's what happens in The Other Woman. So... You kind of, excuse me, you kind of talked about some of this, uh, like the, the history leading into this episode. This is one of those episodes that I really, really wish I could appreciate with the original context within the chronology of the show, like when you first heard it when it came on the radio. Because by the time that Victoria and I heard this episode, we had both heard albums 38 and 39 many times, which includes Agnes's full ascent and descent with the Nova Box, as well as her journey to find Joanne in the pack. Uh, we'd even heard her in For Better or For Worse in album 44, and her minor appearance in there. Uh, so we knew all about her story and her situation, and the previously on segment in album 38 actually pulls clips from this episode um, about Tom explaining Ag Agnes's situation. So there wasn't a lot of crazy plot twist to what happens in this episode for us. We already knew Agnes's story, but imagine when this first came out. Like, I really wish I could, like, appreciate, like, what this was like when it first dropped. Because Tom is the fourth largest character on the show, or he was at the time, and his wife is alive, and we'd only heard, ever heard from her one time way back in album three, 25 seasons prior. And she was mentioned a bunch in the case of the missing train car, which is the band Harley version of what happened in Silver Street. And apart from that... I don't remember her being she, mentioned in that one. She and Tom were the one were the foster parents looking oh, after okay. Michelle. Or I've not only, foster parents, but they um, were the ones doing the halfway house. In that. Some of the Harley versions I've only heard once. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. weird. I so don't know Tom, why. Yeah, Michelle was being looked after by Tom and Agnes in that episode. 
uh, and then it switched to like some rando in the the album nine version. Uh, so apart from that, there's not much mention of Agnes, and it was like, where is she? Even with all of this mayoral stuff, there's no mention of her ever, and it would seem like the world's biggest oversight in continuity to have an episode that finally answered that long-standing question in such a heartbreaking dynamic fashion would have been completely unexpected so i wish we could have known what that was like without already knowing about Agnes's story and what was going to happen um could you imagine like lots of people probably thought she was dead yeah maybe that's why they did tom's death the way they did just like never mentioned again mm -hmm. and then suddenly mentioned just like tom um and you you brought this up as well victoria but this episode also does a great job at moving the general plot of aio forward without it being the main focus like the announcement that tom wouldn't run for re-election neatly leads into margaret's election in the next album and i guess it's kind of the inciting incident of the episode although it's not really the focus of the episode like at all yeah but it's well like i said it's kind of like a minor thing going on in the background yeah. but it's still like partially drives the plot because it spurs Bart to do what he does. Yeah. It's slight, like, half inciting incident. Mm -hmm. And as you also pointed out, this is the first episode after Rodney gets out of Juvie from Darkness Before Dawn three albums ago. And, of course, he would later have another brief stint um, in The Slammer after throwing a rock through Novacom's windows in Green Eyes and Yellow Tulips. As you also said, because you covered like all of my notes in your summary, <laughs> this is this is a, indeed a very serious and emotional episode. As much as that is true, there is a ton of great Rathbone banter in this episode, and it still manages to pull off one of the two best developmental episodes for them, along with Tornado, which is incredibly impressive. I, and I really like, and we talked about this definitely before. Yeah, we talked about this in Thank You, God. At length. I really like how they subtly tried to retcon that Rodney Rathbone was actually the Rodney in Thank You God, which I still like to think that he is. You can argue it either way, and both are valid. I like to side on the fact that that is Rodney in that episode. Their pros and cons the argument. We've been over all of that before, so I won't rehash it no, all he, if you he want He says that. that he's like seen her before. Well, exactly. So, that was yeah. that was them trying to do that. Because yeah. it was like, I met her once many years ago heart transition um let me think that's kind of a nice thought though I, I i like to think which i probably said before that like rodney spent a thanksgiving with the design <laughs> crew um i was gonna say something oh yeah this episode easily has a like um is in my top 10 for favorite biblical morals how like and how it talks about um, healing and stuff like that because I think that this episode is always relevant and how like sometimes it doesn't go the way you think and then especially the part where it's like the church can get embarrassed and then just stop bringing oh, it up oh, every I'm, single time I like listen to that part I'm like that is the best line i would argue that's like yeah. the best part this the episode. this topic of like you know healing sickness suffering death and stuff has been touched on in this episode karen um a touch of healing where is thy sting life expectancy a bunch but that specific part you're that you're talking about they've never said that in any other is specific episode. to I'm, this and i'm gonna get there and i'm like, kind like my, of one of my favorite things impressed i'm super impressed with that it. And that line, like, as a kid, not many things could really, like, grab me, but that part always stuck with me as, like, my entire life. Mm -hmm. So that's just, like, a really powerful moment yeah. in the episode. So to, to wind down from the powerfulness, to get back to the, the middle of the episode. The mundane. We'll just reel our way back down a little bit, repel away from that. Um... And we'll bungee jump back after. I, th I think it's interesting because I bring up at the top of this, like, we should have known about Agnes. It is absurd that we would not have known. And so I like that the episode makes every effort to reassure us that we are correct in that fact. That yes, you should have known about Agnes, but you didn't because also other people should have known about Agnes and they also didn't. Like, it's not like, 
oh, everyone knows about Tom's wife this whole time, and yet you, the audience, just haven't happened to hear about it. Ooh, that's kind of weird how that like happened. Kind of like Tom's death and it's... Bernard's supposed <laughs> yeah. death. Um, yeah, they, they emphasize the fact that, no, you are right. It is weird that you don't know. But also, everyone else doesn't know. They also think that it's weird. I was going to say, do you think Connie knows? But then I was like, Connie doesn't know anything about anything. So <laughs> She still doesn't know. Um, um, for so Connie. yeah, I like how they made it such that even Eugene, Eugene somehow hadn't known about Agnes. And beyond, you know, obviously on one point, like that was just an obvious expositional tool to help Tom tell the story to us. Um beyond in a way that was beyond like the less personal version he'd tell the town because if they only gave the exposition through his public address like he wouldn't be able to tell the all of as much personal stuff about it as he would eugene um but eugene not knowing about it also helps emphasize to us how close to his chest tom kept this whole thing and it helps to explain how we as the audience didn't know about it because it's like if eugene didn't know about it there's no way that we or there's very little chance that we would have known about it Eugene spends more time with Tom than we do. Um, there's a brief segment here where Tom drops a huge amount of past info with specific relative time gaps so quickly. Like he drops so much info. You probably had to spend so like an hour listening to it. Was one of, it, was, your, your it was one of those gold mine parts when I was writing the Tom lore. He was like, talks about all these events in his life and in Agnes's life, and he tells like how many months and years passed between each event. And it was. We also get some stuff about Timmy great. in this episode. Yeah. And um, his. Her other son? The other son? There's another son, wasn't there? No, they tried to have another son. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so heavy that not only do they have Agnes suffering from her debilitating depression and unreality issues, but it came on because of the death of Wilbur and then learning of the deaths of Timmy and Tom's first wife and then several miscarriages and then learning that she's sterile. Like, that's a lot of blows. I bet they could, like make an odyssey version of the opening of up and make everyone cry with tom and Agnes. yeah the opening of up that was just one miscarriage yeah i know this and is it'd be like even worse yeah so there'd be no balloons there's a lot of really good things in the discussion on mental illness here i really like how Whitney eugene emphasized the fact that they emphasized to tom that when it comes to things like mental illness you are under absolutely no obligation to divulge details to others if you don't want to. Even if you've taken up public office like Tom, you don't have to tell them anything. I also like how Tom acts incredulous over how all of this is only coming out now, which further points out like how normal it is, is for us to be confused about why we didn't know about Agnes, because even Tom is like, I have no idea how this didn't all come out before now. Um... It's really sad to me, honestly, how few interactions we ever get to hear between Agnes and Tom. Because they're really great and sweet together every, every time they interact. Every single time they interact, I almost cry. I and know. sometimes I do cry, like at the end of Exit. And they're talking about, like, flowers. And I'm always like, <laughs> um. And this is, like, I'd say the most coherent she ever is in this episode when she has the conversation with Tom that we see other than the part at the end where she mentions Timmy um where they have like a full-fledged conversation about like some complex stuff mm -hmm. and she's like completely following it yeah I think you're right and this conversation's always stuck out to me a lot because there haven't been any other conversations like that between them and the She series. definitely, like, she's had other moments where she was completely lucid about things like the end of the pact and on her, like, highest upswing while she was on the Nova box, but nothing that actually showed directly to us her lucidity as much as this conversation. Yeah, yeah. and, like, this was probably the most complex conversation she had next to the one at the end of the pact. Mm -hmm. But for the entirety of the pact, we weren't sure if she was, like, on a proper mental yeah. state or not. So this one just seems to, like, stick out more. And it definitely shows the decline as time goes on. Because, like, even though it's, like, pretty bad where it is in this... It, like, just gets harder and harder each time they talk to each other. Mm -hmm. 
And the Nova Box does not help. It does not. Contrary to (laughs) how it is advertised. Spoilers. It's bad. Um, What? So to to climb back up the feelsy mountain that you were talking about before. Bungee jump back up. Of the heaviness of the mental illness discussion. Um, yeah, Wit's conversation with Eugene is maybe one of the most honest and frank discussions of a serious topic in this entire show. Um, so as someone who has struggled for years and years with mental illnesses, uh, and known many, many friends who have very nearly died from them, um, and in many instances in which I have personally had to intervene to keep them from dying, uh, I'm always touched by the way that this is all handled. The thing that impresses me the most is how Wit, as you were saying, fully, unapologetically calls out the church on the poor ways that they deal with mental illnesses. He talks about how we feel embarrassed by people who don't get healed after we pray for them, how we think of them as bad advertising and subtly wish that we could just cover them up and they just kind of disappear so they don't look make our uh, our faith look too bad to the rest of the world which sounds really bad because it is really bad but also it's true it's super duper true and the fact it's like one that, of the realest moments in yeah all the fact that he was willing to admit to that is a huge deal um how we have difficulty accepting when God doesn't bring healing within the timetable that we want from him, and we try and erase our own history to cover it up, and obviously, you know, not only erasing history there, but, you know, like, erasing other bad parts of church history and just trying to, like, Horatio cover it over. Spat for Spaf- Spafford? I can't say his name. Yeah. Every single time I hear it as well, I always, like, think about this episode... And yeah. what they say, it always confuses me a little bit because I don't know. Maybe I need to read like his wiki page or something like that because I just I've never completely picked up on everything what says on about him in this episode. It's like he went through a lot of bad stuff, and he somehow thought he was Jesus because of well, that? at the end of his life, like way later after the events of. I don't... It is well. Eventually, yeah, he developed a messiah complex and then okay. died. I don't know how that works so because, like, it's... a lot of bad things happened. It's probably unrelated. Okay. I don't... I, I don't know. Um, I just feel like if it was explained better, yeah, the, I would the, understand what they're talking about better. I mean, that's the thing that happens. People are like, I must be the messiah. I've been sent here and, like, specially anointed to, like, salvation of people and stuff to salvation to people yes um yeah so the horatio spafford thing i feel like that specifically is almost like the show confessing about how aio itself was guilty of this very thing of this like erasure to cover over things given that they were now finally telling the end of spafford's story after telling the inspiring uplifting parts of it in it as well 12 albums prior wait do you think people complained that they didn't put that? No, no, no. So I couldn't imagine, so. especially since I say this, like people complaining about that. No, I'm sure no one even knew about it in yeah. the audience. Um, so often we as the church get extremely defensive about covering over past mistakes and current mistakes. Um, we prefer to view ourselves as the church tm capital c the perfect bride of christ rather than the church lowercase c the fallible human organization that tries to one day become that perfect singularity uppercase c church where we slip up we try and focus on the few who did it right historically rather than the majority who did it wrong be that abolition civil rights women's rights someday homophobia and transphobia hopefully like you know, we'd like to look at the Underground Railroad and we're like, yeah, look at the church leaders who are like, yeah, the Bible says slavery is wrong. We're helping to end the slaves. And that's true. They did do that. But also there were plenty of people who called themselves Christians who were fighting very hard to continue Definitely slavery. Confirm and that after use, all the books I read last year and, and the US history. you know, use the Bible and mentions of slavery in the Bible and talking about like submission 
of the sense of ham and stuff like that to justify the continuation yeah. of slavery. Yeah, anyone want to know more about that? Read the uh, Frederick D- Douglass's biography, and you will get a lot of that during his time as a slave. Duh, 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 where was I? Um, we like to think that we're all always on the right side of history, when in reality, there is always this divide throughout the church, lowercase. Um, so it's so meaningful to me that Wit fully confesses to the church's failures in this area. It's so earnest and so honest and sincere and a, an extremely rare moment for the series to, to like say that. And that's this episode is really so important. Good. And then one of my favorite quotes from the entire show, right towards the end, uh, where Eugene asks Wit why Tom hasn't come forward more to pray about Agnes for the church. And, uh, and he's, Eugene's like, well, why doesn't God heal Agnes? And Wit says, his reasons are his own. And Eugene says, but where does that leave us? And Wit says, it leaves us where we've always been, stuck with the frailty of our humanness, dependent on the power of God's will, and obliged to keep praying hard for people like Mrs. Riley and the Tom Rileys of the world who help them. It's one of my all-time top fave AIO quotes. This episode is so good. Um, and then bonus stuff from the guide. Uh, behind the scenes, The Other Woman. You can read it if you want to write it. Okay. The Other Woman was created to answer a long-standing question, what became of Tom's wife, Agnes? She'd appeared in Thank You, God, in album three, and then seemed to disappear without a trace. Considering the tragedies endured by both Tom and Agnes, we thought the best explanation was that she suffered from a form of manic depression. This also gave us the opportunity to finish that story about her Horatio Spafford that began in It Is Well in album 16. People often write in asking where we found the story about Horatio Spafford's messiah complex. The story appeared in the story of the hymns and tunes by Theron Brown and Hezekiah Butterworth, originally published in 1906. The basic facts were confirmed in a Christianity Today article in 1996. Well, that answers my question that yeah. I had before. Yep, that's why I was waiting, because I knew that would come at the end. Why didn't you just tell me it was explained in the behind the scenes? Because we were going to get there. Build up. Oh, sorry, Victoria. We don't script everything in advance, okay? You know, I didn't have time to pre-plan how I was going to organize the segues between things. Well, why not? You're anyway. right. We should go back to, like, the early episodes when we scripted, like, every word of our transitionary stuff. Oh, it's so bad. I was thinking we should do, like, a reaction to the first episode, but that would just be us, like, in fetal position on the floor. It, just, it would I be can't, sickening. I can't watch the first episode of this podcast. I did, like, two years ago or something like that, and it was cringeworthy back then. It would be even worse now. Yeah, but you know what? You grow. You grow. You get better. You find it. You find it. You get you there. You find it. You get there. You get there. You get there. Um, Stop flirting with the viewers, It's practice. Kevin. It's practice. For what? You practice over time and get better. At flirting? Yes. <laughs> so, the other woman. Final thoughts, Victoria? This episode is so good. I feel like there's nothing else I can... Well, there's actually plenty else I can say. Every single Rathbone in this episode, I feel like this episode, except for Rodney, I guess just um, Bart and Doris, it shows like the best of their characters. It shows like how wonderful they can be and how complex they are, I mean... even though they don't Wonderful is kind of a strong word. I mean, they well, did a horrific, yeah. horrific thing, and then they felt bad and went for a walk afterwards. They didn't really do anything yeah. to fix it. That's so true. wonderful is kind of a, a, a strong word. But it shows word. that they're... Fine, I'll rephrase it. It shows that they're not as, like, stereotypical as they might seem, and they are deeper than that. And I have a weakness, and it makes me very teary-eyed when other Bart uses that, like, very low, calm tone of voice, and he just knows he's done a bad thing, and he just doesn't know what to do, 
And I'm always like, oh, I'm gonna cry. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. I do know what you're talking about. It happens in Tornado too and stuff like that. Um, this episode's really good. I'm gonna give it a five. This episode is definitely one of the top up there. It's an extremely heavy this episode is extremely perfect. heavy subject matter. Um, like we said, the general the general focus of like long term illness, healing, like why doesn't God heal? When does God heal? Um, I mean to either long term illness or death has been discussed in a number of episodes that we already named earlier. This is the only one that like specifically focuses in on mental illness and also the only one that really has this whole thing that I talked about where wit is like confesses to how awful the church has been historically at handling it which yeah it's it's huge we're so bad at admitting when we've done wrong which is ironic because that's kind of supposed to be our whole thing that's like our yeah. whole deal and we're really bad at it so it's it's sad to say that it it's honestly like I think the saddest part of it is it saddens me so much to say that it's such a unique moment to hear like that admission of guilt that yeah. should be something we get all of the time we should be constantly looking back and repenting for the things and that the we've thing done. is you don't really see that in any other thing Mm -hmm. like any other medium really or you don't really hear about that kind of thing much in sermons or so so yeah so on a on a topic level on a lesson moral level this episode is like hits it out of the park one of the best ones that is out there it's extremely profound and moving very raw and emotional and honest about its subject matter it words things very well and covers it well. Paul McCusker, McCusker, I'm just butchering every single name I say today, did a great job on this episode. I don't know about you, but I think this episode is perfect, honestly. The continuity stuff is, like, huge. Like, like we explained the whole thing. This was probably, at the time, one of the biggest questions in continuity for the show that was out there. And so to have this answered in this way is enormous. And the character development that comes out of it for Tom, for Eugene, sorry, for Eugene and his burgeoning faith and trying to understand these different concepts of faith and for uh, Bar Bart and Doris and then the ongoing continuity as this leads into the future of the um, political realm of the town. It just, it hits like, it hits all the boxes it's not there, it's not often that you get episodes like this that can um, transform so many characters in only one episode in such a big way like with Agnes coming back and everyone finding out mm -hmm. about stuff um, I know lots of people probably think that since like the subject matter can be pretty like deep um, in this episode, they might think that it's more for adults and maybe get their kids to listen to it later when they understand it better. But I, how old do you think I would have been when I first heard this? I don't know. How old do you think we were when we got to this album? <sighs> no idea. Mm. I don't know. I was probably about like nine or something like no, that. No, I'm even older than that. Or. Either way, I was young, but um, I'm really glad I listened to this episode when I was younger because, like, the entire conversation that Wit has with Eugene, I've carried with me forever, and so, like, whenever healing doesn't go the way I expect, I always, like, thought about all that stuff and also the stuff about the church not always being 100% right about everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so important for us to understand, like, the distinction between, like, the church as a human organization, like, a religious organization of people trying to work together to find God 
and the church as in like, I love the way um, C.S. Lewis describes in the Street Tape Letters, like the church, this magnificent, glorious beast spreading herself out through all of time and space this single like unified organism of spirituality who is the bride of Christ, you know, that is what we're working towards. And that's what we like are a part of, but that's not what we mean when we say like, Oh, the fallible church that's messed all these things up. Mm -hmm. We have to understand the distinction between those two things, because if we keep thinking of ourselves as the church capital C all the time without recognizing our fallibility, then that's how we make all these mistakes and refuse to acknowledge acknowledge them, refuse to apologize for any of them. And then that's just bad all the time. Yeah. So after that, what are we going to do next week? <laughs> next time, something even more exciting than the other woman. We are, you get to hear our interview with Kathy Buchanan. <gasps> Kathy Buchanan. It was... So it was so great. It was such a good interview. It was, it was really, really long. We got to answer all of our questions. She and gave us a bunch of exclusive, like first leak knowledge about upcoming episodes. I got she to confirmed talk. like we. I got to talk about my boys with her. Their shocking my boys. Their shocking revelations that come out about like Scandal. things that are upcoming about Scandal. ways that. This podcast has influenced... Don't, don't get too <laughs> egotistical, Devin. It's it's a good interview. Kathy's great and hilarious and very friendly and a delight. And I can't wait for you all to hear the she interview. She is lovely. It's going to be a great time. Until then, thank you for joining us on Our Side of the YouTube. I've been Devin Francis, also known as Leonard Meltzer. And I'm here too. And you have been watching The Adventures in Odyssey podcast. Bye. Goodbye.